They're engaged in an argument. I mean, we, we could have a discussion about that and a very complex and detailed discussion about it. And it just seems to me that that's where I would want to start, with a sense that there is a problem here. And that there is a problem here at least moves one away from that condition of absolute intellectual indifference to the question of God. There is a fight on now, and it seems to me we're back, as it were, in the days where it mattered what answer one gave to that. Well, I, now, I, I haven't I, answered your question, but I'm, I'm simply saying that your engaging with me on that question is already in my book to be doing something called theology. Why does it have to be called theology rather than an extension of what one would call natural science, um, which has taken many unpredictable turns uh, to include, for example, an un a truly unseen world, a world of atoms, which we will never see, um, and then a world of subatomic particles, field forces and so forth, and indeed degrees of uncertainty, which seem to be mathematically describable. Um, those themselves are opening up all sorts of possibilities within this, the sphere of natural science, which doesn't seem yeah. to require something beyond as an, an explanation. Yes. I'm not sure that it does have to be called theology, and I wouldn't bother about names there, but there is a reason, it seems to me, why it can't just be an extension of natural science. It, it, it seems to me that, 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 that there is all the difference in the world between a question concerning how things are and the question concerning that things are, a question which has to do with the fact that things are, if you, if you see what I mean. Um, because if you are, as it were, setting that things are against a background of nothingness, then one's beginning to entertain questions about creation. And the classical theistic doctrine of creation is that creation is ex nihilo, out of nothing. Now, it's a curious expression, as, as Thomas Aquinas pointed out, that nothing isn't a funny kind of something of any kind. As he said, it, th there isn't a kind of thing that the name nothing names. I mean, there are philosophers who go about as if <laughs> it did. Um, but uh, Thomas Aquinas was absolutely clear about it. He says, look, it's a very odd sort of making that you're talking about here because the negation negates the out of. It's a making, but there's no out of going on here. Yes, but you see, I think one of the things that always worries me about these these oh. uh, these fathers and yeah. uh, these uh, uh, theologians, I by the way, so yes. as to prove that I'm not a one-off. Oh, no, just no, I know, the no, wall, I know, because I, I mean, this is classical no, theism. No, I know it's been going on yes. a long time. Yes. This sort of yes. stuff, but it always seems to me to be rather similar to the uh, rather brilliant piece of improvisation that my friend John Bird did when mm. he played the Frog Footman in my production of Alice in Wonderland, oh, yeah. and he improvised rather brilliantly suddenly in the carol. Uh, mode yeah. when Alice is thundering on the door of the pepper cook's kitchen and she can't get in and he says to you I'll tell you what I'll do for you um, and then she looks at him uh, questioningly and he says uh, I'll tell you what I'll do for you nothing Would that be any good for you um, he said I can't do it straight away um, because I've got all these things keep propping yes. up so, and then he said brilliantly and in a very uh, Thomistic way he mm -hmm. said if I was to do nothing for you I'd have to find the time see when I could squeeze it in now there is a beautiful intelligibility yes. about that joke. Mm. But the reason why it's a joke mm. is that we know that he's using nothing as if it were something that's about right. which that's we can right. talk. Mm. But then I can't get my mind around the notion of this omnipotent creator mm. existing in this nothingness who then creates something out of the nothingness mm. or brings something about, leaving the question of why is there a god at all? Mm. Well, I, 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 I acknowledge the force of your bemusement about that, and of course so do the theologians who say that <clears throat> uh, it couldn't be the case that the god in question was a sort of thing. I mean, the classical theologians say, well, god is not any kind of thing. Because if God were a kind of thing, God would just be one of the other kinds of things that there are, only a rather different one. So we're not talking about something that's on the map of creation. We're talking about something which is off the map of creation, which is why what we're talking, you know, how we're talking now, is a kind of bamboozling nonsense, if you like. That's, by the way, called negative theology. Mm. That is to say, knowing that you don't know what you're talking about at this stage.
And I think that's the, the, really what theology is about. It's the sense that on the other side of our language is something which sustains it, which can't be contained within it. And I think this is what Wittgenstein was after at the end of the tractate, uh, the end of the tractate is when he said, well, what underlies how we say things cannot itself be said. Yes. And that's what we call God. But um, it could also be claimed that what lies beyond the possibility of being expressed or mm. said is something about which um, you'd better be silent mm. in, in mm. order not to talk nonsense. Mm. Sure. Sure. Um, and, and, and you leave it at that, as, as, as Russell uh, uh, said when he was arguing with mm. Father Copleston. Mm. Um, you simply have to say, well, that, that, that's what there is. Mm. Um, but it doesn't seem to me that one can press the uh, reiterated child's questions of why, merely because it has a question mark behind oh, it, oh, um, oh. to an infinity, oh, oh. Uh, merely because you can sure. reiterate at will. Reiteration is not necessarily no, a no, sign no, of no, continuity. I, I, no, I agree. I mean, I think there is an argument to be had as to whether the question makes sense or whether it isn't just, as it were, the irritating childish pressing of a question beyond all possible meaning. Um, and I think there is a case to be made for saying that the question doesn't make sense. But you can't simply say the world is just a fact, there isn't anything more to be said about it, because that's a refusal to discuss whether the question does or doesn't make sense. I just think there is an argument to be had here, and I think having that argument is, uh, as I say, already beginning to do theology. Well, as you can see from all this, theology, modern or otherwise, can be maddeningly obscure. But what intrigued me since Dennis had been quite clear in his lecture that anything that went beyond the idea that God was the answer to the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is mere idolatry. What intrigued me was how Dennis was able to apply this notion of God to his daily life. You've already given me a position of an extremely attenuated uh, initial state, or a non-initial state, about which there is a legitimate question to be asked. Now, it seems to me that the way you describe it, it is so attenuated, this nothingness, that I find it hard to as it see it as being a, a content of belief, such that it could animate your life, give energy to your moral existence. Well, here's a sort of soundbite answer. Um, uh, Russell says, the world is just simply given, mm. it's a fact. I would say nearly right, but not quite right, because the world is actually gifted. That is to say, it, is, it comes, as it were, as a gift of a certain kind. In other words, it is given in... It is in given the, in, in the, the sense in which, in which there's sense. a giver. Yes. Uh, and whatever it is accounts for the fact that there is what there is, you know, is going to be the giver, the creator, the yes. giver you know, of, of this. And so existence is a certain kind of gift. I mean, my existence or anybody's existence or that there is anything at all is in the manner of a gift. And, of course, one begins to move further in the direction of what I actually believe about things when we, we make this move from saying the world is simply given, to saying that it has been given to us, that there is an author of it, it is, as it were, given to us by a God who... And a further step down that line is that this is not an ironic gift, this is a gift of a good and loving God. Now, there are all sorts of steps that have to be taken to get from that very, very primitive grip yes. about the Creator up to that, um, to that sort of point. And there are many obstacles to taking those steps with any degree of confidence, one of them, of course, being the immediate problem, the problem of evil. Well, let's leave the problem of evil on one side for the moment sure. and talk about the gift mm -hmm. and talk about the donor. Yeah. Now, it seems to me that language being what it is, the notion of donation mm -hmm. and gift and giving mm -hmm. are uh, inseparable from the recipient. Yes. Now, what I would like to know is uh, to whom is the gift Yes. Donated. Yes. Now, the only things that are in a position to be conscious recipients are, in fact, human beings. Yes. Now, if this donor mm. is preparing this gigantic uh, box of gifts, mm. why is it that it took so long to create the, uh, the grateful recipient? Mm. Why were there eons of mm. non-recipients? Sure. Is any other world possible than this world. I mean, 
one can invent possible worlds. In fact, one, on some account, some cosmologists account, all the possible